Good morning dear friends and welcome to this module. With this module we begin a critical analysis of Butler's significant work Undoing Gender which was published in 2004. We will be analyzing this critical work in two modules. In Undoing Gender, Butler critiques the norms surrounding gender and sexuality and advocates for a more inclusive vision of gender. While many of Butler's books are intended for a highly academic audience, Undoing Gender reaches out to a much broader readership. She questions various assumptions prevalent in the society regarding gender and scrutinizes how marginalized populations attempt to counter these norms. Butler states that the purpose of the book is to connect problematics of gender and sexuality to the tasks of persistence and survival. She has discussed issues affecting a number of communities including the lesbian, gay, transgender, transsexual and intersex. The book is a collection of essays on individual topics which describe the experience of becoming undone in good as well as in bad ways. The cover picture of Undoing Gender is inspired by Butler's finding that the progress towards gender equality has been a zigzag rather than a straight line. So, she acknowledges the positive developments and also takes a critical stand against some of the advances in the context of gender. Throughout the book, Butler discusses some of the misguided attempts to regulate gender and how there are several forms of resistance to go beyond the binary gender categories of the past. Contemporary queer theory separates sexuality from gender. So, there is no assumption that one's gender indicates one's engagement in a certain sexual practice. In Undoing Gender, Butler revisits her book Gender Trouble from 1990s and discusses what she sees differently now. As Atticus Zavaleta has mentioned in a review, Judith Butler asks how we can undo the restrictive norms of gender and sexuality and considers various ways in which we are all undone by grief, by gender, by desire and the other. Butler briefly investigates the topic of sex reassignment by studying an account of an individual who had to undergo physical and psychological treatment for what is more commonly known as gender normalization. Butler maintains that norms are necessary and yet must be exceeded in the name of the future of the humans. Perhaps more overtly autobiographical than any previous books, Undoing Gender asks what makes a gender livable. The title is highly suggestive as through this title she also wants to suggest that a normative conception of gender can limit the understanding of one's personhood and undoing this normative restriction is something that she attempts to achieve through this work. Butler asserts that if gender is a performance, then it is neither automatic nor inherent because gender is a doing an incessant activity often without one's will and knowing. It is therefore a practice of improvisation within a scene of constraint. People do not perform their gender alone but in relation to others. This relates to the title of the introduction acting in concert. In the context of gender, society recognizes certain people as fully human and others as somehow less than human. According to Butler, the social recognition becomes a site of power by which the human is differentially produced. A lack of recognition compromises some people's ability to live a full life and this relates to race, gender and other categories. Butler explores the concept of what is a livable life and the importance of recognition and belongingness in her later works. 
intersex people are coerced to choose a gender and are even sometimes made to undergo surgery to comply to gender binary or to feel belonged in a society. Similarly, transgendered people are marginalized, lesbian or gay people are either denied marriage rights or are compelled to conform to heterosexual marriage norms. In Butler's opinion, sexuality is not automatically connected to gender. Being a certain gender does not guarantee that a person will exhibit a certain kind of sexual behavior. Butler endeavors to show that if a decade or two ago gender discrimination applied tacitly to women, it no longer serves as the exclusive framework for understanding its contemporary usage. Because for Butler, gender now also means gender identity, a particularly salient issue in the politics and theory of transgenderism and transsexuality. In the first chapter of Undoing Gender, Butler writes about how society does not value all human beings equally. Most democracies in the world guarantee rights of equality, but it is often limited to legal and constitutional status. She refers to the concept of anthropocentrism, which states that humans are the most valuable beings in the world. This approach will lead to questions of what constitutes a human life and what does not. No essentialist notion of human can be all inclusive. Marginalized communities such as those that include intersex, transgender, transsexual, lesbian, gay and bisexual people must continue to fight for bodily autonomy. At the same time, it is important to note that there are limits to how much autonomy an individual can have because there is a public aspect to an individual's body and being. Butler says that sexuality does not follow from gender in the sense that what gender you are determines what kind of sexuality you will have. Hence, sexuality becomes open to a number of social articulations that do not always imply binding relations or ties. Debates on gay marriage involve a rethinking of both the social and psychic landscapes of kinship structures. Butler suggests that marriage and same-sex partnerships should be options for people who are not heterosexual, but these options should not be held up as an ideal. For Butler, same-sex marriage should not become a model or a necessity for sexual legitimacy, as this will further create more constraints on the sociality of the body. Sexual minorities experience grief on a number of fronts, from losing loved ones to diseases like AIDS to violent attacks on members of their marginalized communities. Butler believes that the person who threatens violence proceeds from the anxious and rigid belief system that the society upholds. That a sense of the world will be lost if an uncategorizable being is permitted to live in this world. Butler wonders if humans can grieve collectively and lean on each other rather than turning to violence. She says that the struggle for realization of certain values which are democratic and non-violent is precisely what is needed for normalizing gender differences. After 2005, Butler dedicates a considerable amount of work towards understanding resistance and non-violence in her critical oeuvre. This is reflected in this quote, where Butler says that violence is surely a touch of the worst order. And she also suggests that the will in which life itself can be expunged by the willful action of another has to be countered. Therefore, when sexual minorities speak of sexual rights, they are not merely speaking of their individual desires, but they are also speaking of the need for legal protections against violence. In the second chapter, Butler looks at regulations, laws and policies that constitute legal instruments through which persons are made regular. 
Regulations in the context of gender can be legal, military, psychiatric and a host of others. Butler asks questions on how such regulations are imposed and how they have become incorporated and lived by the subjects. She refers to Foucauldian scholarship to highlight that regulatory power acts upon a pre-existing subject, it shapes and forms the subject. In a regulated society, Butler finds that gender can become a mechanism by which notions of masculine and feminine are produced and naturalized. Inspired by Foucault's post-structuralist approaches, Butler notes that gender can also become the apparatus by which such regulations are deconstructed and denaturalized. Butler notes that one cannot keep the term gender away from or limited to masculinity and femininity because this would become an attempt to safeguard a theoretical perspective which offers an account of how the binary of male and female exhausts the semantic field of gender. She shows that when one refers to phrases like gender trouble or cross gender, one is already suggesting that gender has a way of moving beyond the naturalized binary. Thus, a restrictive discourse on gender that insists on the heterosexual binary performs a regulatory operation of power and Butler believes that there are ways to escape this hegemonic instance. According to Butler, and I quote, the field of reality produced by gender norms constitutes the surface appearance of gender in its idealized dimensions, unquote. In other words, the norm is actively conferring reality only by virtue of its repeated power to confer authenticity. Such ideals are historically formed and reproduced in society. They are invoked and cited by bodily practices. These bodily practices also have the capacity to alter the norms in the course of their citation. To further elucidate this idea, Butler reflects on the views of American feminist scholar Catherine McKinnon to discuss the quotes that sexual harassment tend to assume. If we follow the reasoning of McKinnon in her famous work Feminism Unmodified which was published in 1987 and became immediately popular in academic circles, harassment consists of a systematic sexual subordination of women at the workplace. This means that men are generally positioned as the harasser and women as the harassed. These regulations which are meant for constraining sexually demeaning behavior also contain within them tacit norms of gender. Gender emerges as McKinnon has commented as the congealed form of the sexualization of inequality between men and women. For McKinnon, the hierarchical structure of heterosexuality in which men are understood to subordinate women is what produces gender misconceptions in culture. Butler demands for a broader approach than McKinnon's understanding of heterosexual subordination. She notes that McKinnon's approach reduces gender to sexuality and offers no insight into non-heterosexual relations like the possibility of same-sex sexual harassment. In contemporary queer theory, one does not presuppose sexuality to a given gender. Queer theory seeks to separate sexuality from gender. Butler argues that gender itself is internally unstable. In this context, Butler gives the example of how transgendered people are the evidence for the breakdown of any lines of causative determination between sexuality and gender. In the context of regulatory gender norms, Butler discusses the case of surgical correction for intersexed children. Children who are born with irregular primary sexual characteristics are sometimes, so to say, corrected in order to enable them to have a better fit or to make them feel more comfortable in the society. 
Corrective surgery is sometimes performed with parental support and often in the name of achieving normality. Butler argues that the physical and psychic costs of the surgery has proven to be enormous. For her, these persons have been submitted to the knife of the norm. The bodies produced through such a regulatory enforcement of gender are, according to Butler, bodies in pain. They bear the marks of violence and suffering throughout their lifetime. In chapter 3 of Undoing Gender, Butler expresses the idea that justice is not just connected to how people are treated in a society. It is also connected to social norms and whether or not people are accepted fully as human beings. It is concerned with consequential decisions about what a person is and what social norms must be honored for personhood. Butler asks, and I quote, what it is to live, breathe, attempt to love, neither as fully negated nor as fully acknowledged as being, unquote. This relationship between intelligibility and being human carries a certain theoretical urgency. The criterion by which we judge a person as a gendered being justly or unjustly governs the recognizability of the human. Butler discusses what popularly came to be known as the John John case. David Reamer was born with XY chromosomes and at the age of 8 months, his sexual organ was accidentally burnt and severed in the course of his subsequent surgery. A year later, the parents of the baby boy were advised to transition him to be a girl. The psychologist John Money oversaw the sex reassignment procedure. The baby was renamed from David to Brenda. The parents were convinced that if the child underwent this transition surgery to become a girl, the child can socialize, develop normally and can also adapt perfectly to the new gender. On the insistence of the medical professionals and due to the pressures expected from the society, the parents also agreed for the surgery. At the age of 8 and 9, however, Brenda started showing signs of a boy and underwent traumatic experiences at school. Doctors suggested, if I can say, dubious psychiatric treatment and medical supplication of estrogen and none of it worked. What resulted was a very frightened and disoriented human being. A different set of medical professionals and psychiatrists intervened in the case and eventually considered the whole procedure as a mistake. The new set of psychiatrists and doctors offered her the choice of changing paths which she accepted and she started living as a boy named David Dreamer at the age of 14. Suffering from extreme depression, David committed suicide at the age of 38. Butler vehemently argues that surgery performed on intersex children to look normal may leave them mutilated and scarred. She says that the norms governing what is a worthy, recognizable and sustainable human life did not support his life. Life for him was always a wager and a risk. At a later stage of his life, Rima decided to go public with his story to raise awareness and to help discourage similar medical practices. Reamer and his mother were interviewed in 2000 by Oprah Winfrey. Before this interview took place, Reamer had remained anonymous for public and also for the media. This interview showcases how traumatized his childhood was. For years, this case was called a medical triumph, but in truth, the case was a failure devastating the lives of just about everybody involved. This is David, who has remained anonymous until now, uh, only known in the medical journals as John Joan. And this is Janet Reimer, David's mother, who made the agonizing decision to change the sex of her son and to raise him as a girl. And what you all at home didn't see during the taping of that piece, um, we could tell Janet you're you know, 
moved and probably disturbed by uh, what you're saying. And David, you, you comfort her. Yes, uh, she's hurting right now. Uh, mothers are all over the world are all alike. There's guilt. Uh, it's darned if you do and darned if you don't. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what things that were done were done out of compassion, out of love for your child. Mm -hmm. and, and how can I hate my mother for that? Mm -hmm. Did you think he would hate you? Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Did you hate yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. So you talk on the tape about the day you first put the dress on. Did you have agonizing feelings about it even when the doctor, or were you of that generation or kind of person when the doctor said this would be best? Did you all believe that it would be best? Yes, I had complete faith in the doctor. Mm -hmm. I believed it would be best. But when he started to rip it off, I started to have doubts. Mm -hmm. And during the whole journey of trying to create a feminine being, there were doubts along the way, but I couldn't afford to contemplate them because I couldn't afford to be wrong. I couldn't have faced the alternative. And the alternative being what? That you'd made this horrible mistake? Yes. Because then what could you do? Right. Since, you, since your earliest memories, you never felt like you were a boy, a girl? I never quite fit in. Uh, uh, well, the girls would do their things with their Barbies and things like that. And that wouldn't interest me. Mm -hmm. And uh, things such as trucks and uh, building forts and, uh, you know, getting to the odd fist fight and mm -hmm. climbing trees. That's the kind of stuff that I like, but it was unacceptable. So I'd never... As a girl. As, as a girl, I had no place to, to fit in. David could not live according to the gender decided for him by the doctors. In this interview, David explains how when he was young, he could never fit in with other children. Although the doctors and the societal norms gave him the identity of a girl, he would go back to his natural inclination of being a boy. Not only his childhood, but also his adult life and his family were deeply affected by such a terrible scientific experiment. This is why Butler argues against the act of forced sex reassignment surgery on children. In Chapter 4, Butler enters the debate on the removal of the diagnosis of GID or Gender Identity Disorder from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. This manual is published by the American Psychiatric Association and it is considered to be the authoritative text which defines and classifies mental disorders in order to improve diagnosis treatment and research. Some medical professionals wanted to keep the GID diagnosis in the manual because insurance companies would not cover certain medical procedures for transitioning gender without a diagnosis. Gender identity disorder or GID refers to a condition in people who experience distress because of a significant incongruence between the gender with which they personally identify and the gender with which they were born. Diagnosing a gender is a necessity for medical insurance. This technicality is a serious consideration in a country like the US where medical costs are very high. So getting covered by the medical insurance is the only way people who are seeking treatment will be able to afford it. Furthermore, the LGBTQ community wants to keep the diagnosis as it offers certification for a condition and facilitates access to a variety of medical and technological means for transitioning. It is important for these reasons not to understand sex change surgery or hormonal usage as an elective surgery. There are other consequences revolving around the diagnosis. Butler says that to be diagnosed with GID is to be found in some way to be ill, sick, wrong, out of order, abnormal and to suffer a certain stigmatization 
as a consequence of this diagnosis. Such a stigma around the medical condition is what led many people arguing for an elimination of the diagnosis from the manual altogether. The diagnosis subscribes to a form of psychological assessment which assumes that certain gender norms have not been properly embodied and that an error and a failure have taken place. Through a closer analysis of the definitions in the manual, Butler shows how a diagnosis of GID in most cases is equated with a diagnosis of homosexuality. This means that homosexuality is also implied as a gender disorder which is strongly condemned by Butler. Additionally, the diagnosis may cause emotional damage by injuring the self-esteem of a child who has no mental disorder. Butler suggests that parents have to be supportive of what Dr. Richard Ise calls gender atypical traits, that is early parental admonitions and interventions to curb or replace those traits which are considered as feminine in conventional societies with more typically known male behaviors. This may be harmful to the child's development, particularly to the emotional resilience of a child. As a result, some gay adults have lost their capacity to recognize and express a variety of effects and some attempt to avoid intimate relationships that evoke these and other repudiated feminine traits. Butler agrees with this view and notes that such an approach would help for a reconceptualization of gender attributes. In chapter 5, Butler looks at the question of kinship and asks whether it is always already heterosexual. She looks at how the definition of kinship is linked to marriage and how it is often perceived in terms of heterosexual marriage only. For Butler, kinship is not a fully autonomous sphere distinct from community and friendship and regulations of the state. And she says, kinship is a set of practices that institutes relationships of various kinds which negotiate the reproduction of life and the demands of death. Kinship practices emerge to address fundamental norms of human dependency, which may include birth, child rearing, relations of emotional dependency and support, generational ties and death. In recent sociology, conceptions of kinship have become disjoint from the assumption of marriage. Butler takes the example of African American kinship and she refers to the new studies conducted by Nathaniel Mackey and Fred Morton. The enduring history of slavery of African Americans shows the disposition of kin relations. This set of kin relations offers a continuing legacy of wounded kinship within African American life. It has been a site of state surveillance, normalizing pressures and political delegitimization. Therefore, it is not possible to separate questions of kinship from property relations and fictions of bloodline as well as national and racial interests by which these lines are sustained. Butler studies the ethnographic descriptions of lesbian and gay kinship relations that emerge outside of heterosexually based family ties. The state may offer legitimacy to people who are not heterosexual and desire to marry as heterosexuals in the traditional form, but it will not sanction people who enact sexual agency outside of established norms. This lends itself to the formation of hierarchy of legitimacy and illegitimacy among queer people. The petition for marriage rights seeks to gain state recognition for non-heterosexual unions. The normalizing powers of the state are made especially clear when we analyze the quandaries about kinship and limits in marriage. Butler says, and I quote this longish passage from her, marriage has also been separated from questions of kinship to the extent that gay marriage legislative proposals 
often exclude rights to adoption or reproductive technologies as one of the assumed entitlements of marriage. She says that the sexual field is circumscribed in such a way that sexuality is already thought of in terms of heterosexual marriage. The default marriage privilege extended to heterosexuals is not comprehensive of all unrepresentable or unthinkable sexual possibilities. When she was writing this book in 2004, countries like Germany and France only had included such rights like adoption in their proposals of gay marriage. Butler also highlights some of the problematic concerns associated with the state legitimization of gay marriage. And she says that to be legitimized by the state is to enter into the terms of legitimation offered there and to find that one's public and recognizable sense of personhood is fundamentally dependent on the lexicon of that legitimation. The sphere of legitimate alliance is established through the producing and intensifying regions of illegitimacy. The same-sex marriage debate may transform the current understandings of gay and lesbian identity. The claim that marriage is about love and offers recognition of gay and lesbian love is vital to the pro-same-sex marriage position. Michel Foucault's insistence on the importance of love, friendship and affection explains perhaps why same-sex marriage has become so central to lesbian and gay politics. Butler shows that a fundamental sense of occlusion is exercised by the state while establishing the discourse of legitimacy. It can be said to conclude that Butler wonders why marriage or domestic partnership is the only way to allocate things like health care benefits. She believes that there should be ways of organizing health care entitlements in such a way that everyone, regardless of their marital status, should have access to them. Such exclusionary nature of health care benefits leaves behind the community of the non-married, the single, the divorced, the uninterested and the non-monogamous. Such state laws which disable the non-heterosexuals from securing their rights are representative of prevalent homophobic discourses. This also shows the importance of revising and reworking the social organization of friendship and community to produce non-state centered forms of support and alliance. So, in this module, we have looked at certain topics from the initial chapters of undoing gender, such as the medical diagnosis of gender identity disorder, gender correction surgery, the relation between kinship, human rights in marriage. In the next module, we shall examine the second part of Butler's undoing gender. We will focus on chapters from 6 to 11 which deal with areas such as sexual differences, bodily confessions and the question of social transformation. Thank you.